I am the Chief Advisor for Federal CX at Qualtrics, and I'm also a former CX leader for a federal government agency. I'm Trevor. Yeah. Yeah, you're on. I'm Trevor DeLue. I'm with Qualtrics. I've been with Qualtrics about six years, and I've been trying to help the government do a better job of supporting those they serve. At, you know, back in 2013, we didn't really know what it was called. We didn't know it was called CX, but uh, you know, really happy to be here and talk to you about some of the things that, that I've seen and I've learned, uh, and that I think as a community we have all benefit from. So we wanted to just kind of have a fireside chat today because um, there's a lot of encouragement, I guess you could say, right now coming from the White House, OMB, uh, even the GAO and the IG, um, the President's Management Agenda to encourage best practices when it comes to integrating the principles and practices of CX as a business discipline into federal government agencies. In all of those channels of influence, the GAO, the IG, OMB, the White House, we continue to come back to measuring customer experiences and collecting customer feedback as being one of the central things that, that you need to do to do this work right and do it well. But roadblocks are still there. Everything from the Paperwork Reduction Act to funding to executive buy-in, uh, other priorities that just seem to come up from time to time. And so we just kind of wanted to talk about some of these things and how do you still get the work done? Because the work still has to get done. And um, so we brought to you today just kind of a short fireside chat. And lucky me, I get to be in the interview spot because Trevor is the subject matter expert on security and agility. And we wanted to talk through some of these topics with you today. So you ready to go? I am. All right, so my first question is, um, we hear and see a lot about great technology being one of the things that you really have to do right and do well to get CX right in the government setting or even in the private sector. But it's not just about great tech. What's the right mindset that executives and program managers need to bring to the table to do this work right and do it well? <clears throat> Good question. So I think, first of all, it's not trying to boil the ocean up front, not doing too much planning, not getting too far out in front of yourself to where you build this big monolithic black box that's gonna be really hard to get anything done. It's all about small incremental wins that can be reported up. And I also think it's critical that there's a right balance between governance and autonomy. You wanna make sure that, that executives in the agency are effectively governing how people are doing it, but not at the expense of getting things done. So ensuring that there's a proper level of autonomy across the agency to allow people who've been activated and go out and, and try to improve the experiences that they're capable and equipped to do so. Now, I think there are roadblocks you can't avoid, like PRA. I think there are roadblocks you can kind of try to swerve around. Uh, but I think you know, fundamentally the biggest thing that I've seen is not equipping frontline leaders in the agency who run different programs to go out and do what they believe they need to do to collect what they need to be able to collect uh, <clears throat> To, to improve the experiences they provide without kind of losing associativity back to the core team at you know, headquarters or corporate. Let's pivot now to the subject of security in customer experience. I'm talking about data security. As we're collecting customer feedback, you know, it used to be that, that doing a customer survey was a simple, harmless thing that you could do to get closer to your customers and better understand them. But it's not that simple anymore. Can you talk to us about the security implications that need to be considered uh, when you're doing this work in an agency setting? Sure. So who's tried to get an ATO through the process? Anyone? ATOs? ATOs, we have a hand over here. Was it fun? Was it painful? Was it hard? It wasn't fun. It was painful. It was hard. Uh, so I think, first of all, selecting a platform that has been through that process, been through that, has ATOs on the website. FedRAMP is key. It was written for a reason. It's hard for a reason. And I think there's a lot of confusion out there in the market about FedRAMP. What we've seen is that there's a lot of different ways to get products up on the FedRAMP marketplace. You've all been there, you go look at it. But the one thing to really look at is how many ATOs that provider has. Because that ATO listing tells you that they've been through that process, however many ATOs they have. Uh, <clears throat> I think, too, is that as the government does a better job of connecting with people in the moments that matter, those moments are often emotional moments. And when people are emotional, they don't necessarily think clearly and sometimes give more information than they should share, knowing if it was logical, they wouldn't do it. Uh, so expecting that you're going to get information from those you serve that you don't really want because it's PII. So having some sort of AI component or, or you know, <clears throat> autonomous part of the product which is actively seeking and searching through information people are providing you and automatically redacting it or telling them that they should not be submitting that. So, so what you're saying is 
even if you don't ask for PII, you're going to get it. You're going to get it yeah. because of the emotion that's involved sometimes. And they want to solve a problem, and they think that, like common sense would dictate, the more that person knows about me, the more they're going to be equipped to solve my problem. But a lot of times the government does not want that data because the systems they have are not you know, accredited to kind of actually host and manage it. So look for a tool that has these features that you're talking about it, yeah, um, that it, can it, help you with the It gets security. back to the roadblock of, of getting things done where if, if your security folks go through the process of trying to uh, get an ATO, these are all the things you're going to look at. So if the products have those sorts of capabilities in it, you're going to get through that process a lot quicker. What do you think is the best collaboration for something like that? Uh, CX leaders need to talk with their CIOs or make sure, who do they need to make sure they're in collaboration with inside their agencies? Uh, clearly CIO, clearly the, the key stakeholders in the program office. Uh, also the InfoSec team, because you cannot get around them, they're going to be there. Uh, they can make life pretty difficult if they're not engaged early. All right, let's talk a little bit about governance. Um, governance is one of the key attributes that's outlined in OMB Circular A11, Section 280, but there is uh, a little bit of security that goes with that as well. What, how does governance apply to um, keeping customer data secure? <clears throat> so what I've seen in different federal agencies is that when there's a big selection around a big CX tool or platform, and that platform is not uh, is not widely accessible to frontline people in the agency because it's too hard to get it or it's a black box or it's hard to operate. Uh, there's an emotional shift the agency's gone through where they want to go out and empower frontline leaders to do a better job of measuring experiences. And if they can't get their hands on that core enterprise platform that's supposed to do it, they're going to go out and find other ways. They're going to go out and use their P card and buy you know, products that, that are not, have been through the rigors. They're collecting data through channels which they simply shouldn't be. And it, it's hard to get it in the box because, you know, their intent is true. They want to make things better. They really care. They're in government to make things better. But their hands are tied because they don't have access to the tools that they require to actually get the job done. So <clears throat> I think that's a key part of that governance is understanding that people want to go and they want to make things better. And if they're not equipped to do so by what you've offering them, they're going to go and find another way to do it. And we see that all across the government. Let's talk more about that. People want to go. We want to get the work done. Um, but there are still a lot of perceived roadblocks out there. Um, how about things like program design? How can you use things like program design and um, security concerns to speed up the effort and the things that you're trying to do internally rather than, oh my gosh, there's another roadblock that I've got to get through before I can actually get this survey out to my customers or collect this data? Yeah, I think program design is one of those things where you can go too far with it. I mean, you clearly need to do it. You need to align your organization. You need to find what the key wins are. But uh, if you kind of go too hard over on that, you can never kind of get back. I think we've heard a couple times today, agile, flexible, go out, collect some information, learn, tweak, change something, go back out and collect. It's this never ending spiral approach of measuring, improving, measuring, improving. However, if the program design becomes all too encompassing and too hard to change, then you run into that situation where people can't get what they need to go out and make things better. Therefore, they're gonna go off and try to do it their own way. And once you get, let that genie out of the bottle, it's really, really tough to get it back in. All right, so let's talk a little bit about data silos because there are risks inherent in, in data silos. And data quality is something that all agencies are expected to, to talk about and attest to in their annual performance plans and annual performance reviews. But um, data silos are more prevalent than ever before, and this applies to collecting customer feedback. If you have, say, 10 departments in your agency that are, uh, they have their own 10 different accounts, that's 10 silos. So let's talk a little bit about silos, risks, and how you get over that. What, what, what I've seen happen is when uh, <clears throat> agencies have the data in some system, but it was not connected to the broader program and they weren't aware of it, uh, and there was an issue. <clears throat> That's when things get big, because you, you, you had the information, yet you did nothing about it because you didn't know about it because it was in some silo somewhere else. So having a platform that's flexible that can go out and address any number of different use cases so you can make kind of cross correlations is critical. Uh, we heard before, they do, I think it was education, they do market research, they do usability testing, they do customer experience. I guarantee you all those are not in different silos, they are in one single platform because all those things are inextricably linked. If you've got a purpose-built solution for each one of those, you're having silos and you're going to miss information. All right. So um, how, do you, how do you talk more about how you spot that data silo and how you address it? Uh, <clears throat> how you spot the data silo. People are pretty good at hiding those because they don't want to. Right, you know, exactly. They're, they're, in, so they're in a closet <laughs> out there collecting the data. They think they need to collect to do things better. 
Uh, I, I think the way you get in front of it is you provide that, you know, there's, <clears throat> again, it's that autonomy. Like, you have to keep things governed at the top level. You have to make sure people aren't going off and doing rogue things. To do that effectively, you have to enable them with technology that, that you can see, that you understand what they're collecting, that you can course correct, that you've got some control over the hygiene that they're out there interacting with the public on. But if you don't enable them, they're creating a silo, and good luck finding it. All right. So I have a final question for you, and then it looks like we might have a couple of minutes for questions. So there's a lot of can't out there, and when you're building these programs in the federal government, there tends to be a focus of, I can't do that. Those are things that I don't have. What's your advice to focusing on the can, and how can we get things done? How can we focus on the things that we have rather than the things that we don't have to actually push the work ahead and, and start getting stuff done? Uh, I think it's, it's pretty simple. I think it's starting small, collecting meaningful results, socializing the improvements with executives. Uh, and it just creates this natural momentum where some of the best CX leaders in government, I think you'll agree with me, uh, they weren't given a ton of authority up front, but they developed an immense amount of influence by the micro successes that they've kind of achieved. And those micro successes keep on adding up to big, big, larger successes. Uh, but, but it's never sacrifice speed and agility because those two things are really kind of what drives outcomes in the long run. All right, so speed, agility, um, paying attention to the tools that you use because they're not all the same. Correct. And um, focusing on the can rather than, than cannot. Yeah, I don't want to overstate this, but I think <clears throat> there's a lot of talk in the market these days about CX, and everybody approaches it differently, and it's kind of getting a little bit confusing at times. I remember back in the 90s where collaboration was something specific, and then all of a sudden, everything was collaboration. So I think, again, it's it's being quick, getting out there, understanding what your people want, how hard is it to achieve the outcome they want, driving that change back in the organization and, and maintaining a lot of communication outward to executives to build that influence. All right. So we actually have a few minutes left. So are there any? Is that our seven yeah, minutes? Yeah, that's our time. Seven minutes, so, 35 seconds. So we got a few minutes. If we're anyone the hook. has any questions for, for Trevor, we have a question right here in the middle. She's coming with the microphone for you. When you talk about the data silos, where does records management come into play on that? I'd say records management is a form of governance, and the platform that you pick needs to effectively be able to categorize the data you have and have the right kind of custodial and hygiene around that, when it needs to be purged, when it needs to be pushed out. Uh, in some cases, that could be done via an API uh, integration if you've got some sort of rules engine across the agency, but it's part of data governance. Other questions? What does that mean, no questions? <laughs> Did we cover it all? We had a question right over here, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks again for being here. You, you said at the end, never sacrifice speed and agility. Speed, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure, uh, this is going back to some of our early Sure wins in the government around CX, and not what we thought, but what we watched our customers do. And they got things fielded, they got measurements fielded as quick as possible. There were always people across the agency saying, hey look, wait, it's too soon, we gotta talk to those guys, we gotta talk to those guys. And all of a sudden you had a, a measurement that was way too long, people were gonna take it. So some of the things that I learned early on for people who got it done without all this kind of knowledge in the market is they never slowed down for the sake of like, you know, they want to iterate, they, they'll say, hey look, we're gonna do another cycle next week, we're gonna constantly spiral and keep changing, but we're not gonna wait, we gotta go now. And that particular customer was an immense pain that they wanted to get out of. So uh, we see it across other agencies, though, like one of our other large kind of enterprise agency customers, General Services Administration, they, they moved out really, really quick and they're constantly tweaking and they've got the right level of governance and autonomy and as a result, you know, the entire agency's kind of pivoted and understands they all have a role in customer success, but <clears throat> they never slow down. They keep going. A few minutes left. Any further questions? Five minutes and 20 seconds. We have another question here in the front. Hi, so I'm gonna ask a little bit about that can't side. I've done a lot of work where we've been caught with the Paper Reduction Act, the PRA, for surveys. So any updates or guidance on companies trying to better understand 
our government agencies and their attitudes around things when surveys are really difficult and focus groups aren't always a, as effective as you want them to yeah, be. Yeah, the thing with PRA, and I, we can talk both, both talk about this because this is something um, in my own former experience as a CX leader for a federal government agency, it is the law. I would um, always say to look at the fast track process and whether or not that can possibly apply. Sometimes it doesn't, especially if you want to roll those results up and out into something that's public facing. According to the rules, you're not supposed to use the fast track. So you do have to use the the, the other clearance process, but um, for me to get that work in my past life, to get it done, it required a lot of planning, a lot of managing expectations, bringing the PRA liaison in early, alerting her early to know that it was, it was coming down the pike because she had a lot of things um, going on as well. So the planning, taking a look at the options and, um, you know, and when you've got to do your renewals, getting those in the hopper as early as possible. So that's all still the same, nothing has changed, it's still the law. Yeah, it still remains to be a, one of those roadblocks. And, and I would say that getting back to the stovepipe conversation, every agency has far more PRA approvals than they think. If you've got a platform that's capable of governing that over time, you've got an inventory of what's been approved, and you can kind of reuse those across different yeah. channels. Uh, but without that single platform that can kind of manage all that stuff, people don't know, and they're going back every single time. Okay. A couple more minutes. Any more questions? All right. Any, any final words, parting words of advice? No, I, I, I look across the market <laughs> in the last six years and, and those who we compete with, I mean, it's, it's astonishing to see the transformation that's happening and, and, and the focus that's shifted and the results that are being brought to citizens, especially, you know, really, really important ones who need us. So it's been great to watch the industry evolve and we're really proud to be a part of it and look forward to continuing to assist in any way we can. We've come a long way and the work is worth doing. So thank you guys, thank you very much.